Hello and welcome to Inside the Americas, coming up on this edition. Abortion in America faces its strongest challenge in a generation. After Texas, the Supreme Court examines a Mississippi law. The decision will be decisive for reproductive rights throughout the country. The American star Josephine Baker makes history as the first black woman to enter the pantheon of French heroes. Her homeland also remembering her heyday on stage and in support of civil rights. And Barbados says farewell to Queen Elizabeth. The island nation ditched the British Commonwealth to become a republic and also inaugurated its new president. Abortion rights back in the spotlight this week on the continent. First in Chile, lawmakers rejected a bill that would have eased abortion rights by a vote of 65 to 62, legislation that would have decriminalized abortion failed. This means the issue will be frozen in Parliament for at least a year. And over in the United States, access to abortion is once again being taken up by the Supreme Court. The nine justices are hearing arguments over a law in the state of Mississippi that prohibits almost all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. The court became much more conservative under former President Donald Trump. And anti-abortion activists see an opportunity. Mercy on your child. Have mercy on her or him. Mississippi's only abortion clinic continues to see patients as the future of the right to abortion in the United States hangs in the balance. The U.S. Supreme Court is examining a Mississippi law that would ban most terminations at 15 weeks. State officials are using the case as a vehicle to ask the judges to overturn Roe v. Wade the landmark 1973 decision that established a constitutional right to an abortion. As we stand here today, we may well be on the verge of an era when the Supreme Court sends Roe versus Wade to the ash heap of history where it belongs. If the court overturns the precedent, any state would be free to ban it, something which some 26 states, marked here in orange, would be likely to do. Just by agreeing to hear the case, the judges indicated that they're prepared to revisit previous rulings. The court itself was dramatically reshaped in recent years by Donald Trump, who made it his mission to replace defenders of women's rights with conservative judges. The impact of this was apparent in early September, when the court declined a request to block a Texas law that bans abortions after just six weeks of pregnancy, before most women even realize they're pregnant. America's most restrictive abortion law prompted women's rights protests across the country. We want to make sure that the Supreme Court knows that they can't trample on half of the population's rights. Unusual in its construction, the Texas law relies on ordinary citizens to enforce the ban, rewarding them at least $10,000 if they successfully sue anyone who helped to provide an illegal abortion. Other Republican-controlled states, such as Alabama and Louisiana, which have previously had their bans struck down by court order, are now also thinking about using the Texas bill's format. The Supreme Court is expected to return its decision in June. Our picture of the week, the Empire State Building lit up with the colors of the French flag. That in honor of American French performer Josephine Baker, who was entered into France's Pantheon Mausoleum this week. In the United States, Josephine Baker is just as beloved as she is here in France, and nowhere more so than in Harlem, New York City. Our correspondents met with New Yorkers to explore Baker's legacy. Josephine Baker's love affair with her adopted homeland, France, was a lot less complicated than her relationship with the country of her birth, the United States. Her adopted son, Jerry Bouillon Baker, works at the New York restaurant named after her. He's delighted that his mother will now be honoured with a plaque in Paris's Pantheon. I think that... I think at last she is known across the world. She did everything, from being an artist to enrolling in the war to fighting racism, probably because she was black. That's why she traveled to Europe and why she stayed there. She felt free, freer than here. In the early 1920s, Josephine Baker came to New York City and performed with the chocolate dandies at the Cotton Club in Harlem. 
Although she never achieved the same level of fame in the US as in France, Harlem historian Dr. John Manan believes she played a key role in the cultural and civil rights movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. I think she is an icon, not just culturally, but an icon in the civil rights movement. She came in 1963 for the March on Washington, and to be one of the people who had made it and was recognized throughout the world, to give her credibility to the movement made Afro-Americans feel, yes, we have people all over the world. The autumn leaves. Dr. Manan and jazz singer Terry Davis wish to pay tribute to Baker's legacy here in Harlem. Well, I miss you most of all. A few blocks west of the old side of the Cotton Club, 17-year-old Kendall McDowell is on her way to a dance rehearsal with the Harlemettes. People like Josephine Baker, they are trailblazers. They put the mark in. They set the line for everyone else. This school was founded in 1964 at the height of the civil rights movement by a contemporary of Baker, black opera singer Dorothy Maynor. The year before, Baker had told the crowd at the March on Washington that she'd always taken the rocky path and that she'd tried to smooth it out a little to make it easier for everyone else. Good, everybody. Our number of the week, $1.6 million. That's the total amount of a fund collected to help Kevin Strickland survive. He was wrongly convicted for murder, and his innocence was finally recognized after 43 years in a jail cell. That's one of the longest sentences ever served by a person who was wrongfully convicted. Strickland's first stop, his mother's grave. On his first Christmas outside of prison in 43 years, Kevin Strickland got the honor of kicking off Kansas City's holiday season. Four, three, two, one! But the man who spent all these years behind bars for a triple murder he never committed didn't get anything else from authorities. Missouri doesn't give compensation to innocent people wrongfully convicted unless they were exonerated through DNA. Thankfully, Strickland's tragic plight moved so many people, thousands chipped in for a special fund to help him cope. This was the second positive surprise in just a week's time. The first one was his release. I was actually watching a soap opera. And they, <laughs> they went across the news break or whatever they call them, and, and I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. So that's how you learned? That's how I learned. You saw your own name on the screen? In the picture, yes. And then other inmates started hollering, and I heard them beating on walls and carrying on. It's a false testimony from a survivor who brought this miscarriage of justice. Then, age 20, the witness said she identified Strickland lying under oath. She recanted that testimony decades later, and 12 years after that, Strickland was released. What would you say to the judge? Thank you for reviewing all the no evidence that was against me to begin with. I really appreciate him taking his time to listen and understand what really happened in 1978 and how you know, I was an easy mark, and the police took advantage of it. Strickland joins the all-too-long list of innocent people wrongfully convicted. He was deprived of seeing his mother, who died in August. The fund will allow him to focus on changing the system so others don't get locked up, like him, for something they did not do. Barbados has cut ties with Britain's Queen Elizabeth, becoming the world's newest republic. The Caribbean island shed the last vestiges of its colonial system some four centuries after English ships first sailed ashore. Barbados marked the occasion with an extravagant ceremony attended by new president-elect Sandra Mason and Britain's Prince Charles. Andrew Hilliar has more. 
As the clocks struck midnight, Barbados shared its last ties with the British monarchy, almost 400 years after English ships first sailed ashore. I, Sandra Prunella Mason, do swear that I will well and truly serve Barbados in the office of president, so help me God. The world's newest head of state made a call to arms, reminding everyone that their country's future lay in their hands. We are Barbadians. We, the people, must give Republic Barbados its spirit and its substance. We, the people, are Barbados. Among the guests, Rihanna declared a national hero and a more controversial guest, the British heir to the throne. Prince Charles's presence has stirred emotion, with many criticizing the decision to invite a member of the royal family. But Charles insisted on the UK's friendship with Barbados and acknowledged its horrific colonial legacy. From the darkest days of our past and the appalling atrocity of slavery, which forever stains our history, the people of this island forged their path with extraordinary fortitude. Barbados was a central part of the transatlantic slave trade for well over a century. Today's population is overwhelmingly of African descent. By severing itself from the monarchy, Barbados hopes to distance itself from its colonial past. But the future holds big challenges for the new republic. Inflation has driven up prices and COVID-19 has wrecked the island's tourism industry, which is only just beginning to recover. Finally, it's common for parents to reward their children for good grades, perhaps less common for that reward to be tattooing. But for 11-year-old Brandon Burgos, working in his father's tattoo studio in Mexico is his treat. He's already created around 30 tattoos. Brandon's father recognized his talents at drawing starting at age five, and now he's following in dad's footsteps. That does it for us. Thanks so much for watching Inside the Americas and stay tuned for more world news here on France 24. May 13, 1985, Philadelphia, the cradle of American independence and freedom. A police helicopter drops a bomb on a group of activists advocating the return to nature and the end of capitalism known as the move. That day, 11 people were killed, including five children. The whole block looked like, a, uh, like we were in a war zone, you know? I mean, it, looked, it was terrible. Ever held accountable charge for murdering our family, and trust me, it is murder. It wasn't an accident. 36 years later, the police of Philadelphia still deny this version of events. A look back at a forgotten story in Revisited on France 24, and France24.com.